2030. Find out what the people have had to say shortly. Plus, I'll be talking to former Conservative MP and Shadow Home Secretary, the brilliant Anne Widdecombe, who joins me for a deep dive into her career and more controversial views as a former politician. State of the Nation starts now. We'll also be hearing from our panel, political editor of The Mirror, Nigel Nelson, and author and journalist, Joanne Nadler. As ever, I want to hear from you. Get in touch by e emailing mailmog at gbnews.uk. Before all of that, it's been a busy day, and here to keep us up to date is Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thanks very much indeed. Well, the top story tonight on GB News. A couple that went missing with their newborn baby in January have been further arrested on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. Constance Martin and her partner, Mark Gordon, were found in Brighton yesterday and were initially arrested on suspicion of child neglect. More than 200 police officers are searching a 91-square-mile area to try to find the two-month-old baby. Sussex police are assessing the baby's welfare, they say, on an hourly basis. Whilst we still have hope um, that the baby can be found safe and well, we must retain that hope. And we, as you see, the number of officers we have deployed on that open search. However, as time progresses, as the weather is, is closing tonight, as it was last night in terms of um, the cold and the coldness uh, and the impact that would have on a baby, clearly the risk is getting higher. Well, the Prime Minister has visited Northern Ireland today to try to convince unionists to support his new trade deal with the European Union. Rishi Sunak insists the so-called Windsor framework addresses concerns around the Northern Ireland Protocol and urged the DUP to return to power sharing. The deal removes barriers on trade across the Irish Sea, but it still includes a role for the European Court of Justice. Tory bank benches and the DUP are still reviewing the details. If there's a significant EU law that comes along that will have lasting and significant impact on the everyday lives of people here in Northern Ireland, that the Assembly will be allowed to pull the emergency brake. It should be crystal clear, the UK government then does have an unequivocal veto. And what I've said is that the UK government wants to sit down with the parties in Northern Ireland, the Assembly, to codify how the UK government would use that veto. Rishi Sunak. Well, more than 100,000 civil servants are planning a strike on the day of the Chancellor's budget. Members of the Public and Commercial Services Union, which represents government departments, Border Force and DVLA, will walk out on the 15th of March. London Underground staff with the unions ASLEF and the RMT will also strike in disputes over pensions and job losses. And more than 40,000 Marks and Spencer staff are to get a pay rise from April. The hourly pay of customer assistant staff will rise from £10.20 to £10.90, taking their rate of pay above the national living wage. The move will cost the supermarket £57 million, but they're calling it their biggest ever investment into staff salaries. That's all from me. I'm back in an hour. The European Court of Justice is the sole and ultimate arbiter of EU law, and the ECJ will have the final say on all EU law and single market issues. Thus saith Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, after the controversially named Windsor Framework. As I emphasised yesterday, what happens in Ulster matters in Somerset, in Yorkshire, in Merseyside, and in Westminster, the undermining of the sovereignty of the Crown in six counties weakens our United Kingdom as a whole. So although the Prime Minister seems to have done well with the New Deal, some of His Majesty's subjects, citizens of the United Kingdom as much of the rest of us, could remain, at least in part, under the jurisdiction of a foreign power. Perhaps, as Telegraph columnist Cheryl Jacobs suggested today, 
This would mean Ulster is to become a vassal state of the European Union. Well, our fellow citizens on the other side of the Irish Sea have to make do with access to the same British supermarket goods or approved medical supplies as rather superficial compromises. Today, Number 10 has suggested there will be no renegotiation of the deal regardless, regardless of the considerations of either the DUP and their seven tests or of us Brexiteers, 52% of the country, committed to keeping the United Kingdom as an independent sovereign nation. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, has said the deal will go ahead with or without the blessing of the DUP, although the PM has kindly offered to have further talks to explain how the deal works in practice. So, take it or leave it is the message. Is a revolt brewing among my colleagues? Well, I've actually hot-footed it from the ERG, a meeting that we had with all our members, the architects of Brexit, and the grand figures of the ERG were there, the very distinguished Sir William Cash, Bill Cash, Ian Duncan Smith, John Redwood, the chairman, Marc Francois, to have a discussion. And what was being discussed was the technical details. What is in the small print? Because we've learned from our relationship with the European Union now over many decades that it's what in, in the, is in the small print that matters. Remember, for example, that the Working Time Directive wasn't brought in through the social chapter, which we didn't belong to, but was snuck in as health and safety legislation. And we were then addressed by Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. And as you all know, in the United Kingdom, there was the Stone Age and the Iron Age, but in between, there was the Sauce Age. And the Sauce Age is the key to this, because as it's currently proposed, a sausage made in North East Somerset, where they make delicious sausages, could be exported to Northern Ireland, manufactured according to UK rules, but a sausage manufactured in Northern Ireland itself couldn't be sold if it was manufactured to the same standards. It would have to be done to European standards. Does that really make sense? Well, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Ian Paisley to talk about this, but I also want to hear from you. So don't forget to email me at mailmog at gbnews.uk. And not just members of my family, all of you, please, mail in. So, the Prime Minister is desperately trying to garner support for this brand new Brexit deal. And he was in Northern Ireland today, which is where the deal takes effect. Ian Paisley is with me. He's the son of the founder of the DUP, the similarly named Ian Paisley, very distinguished figure, um, the Reverend Ian Paisley. Um, Ian, what do you and your friends in the DUP think of the deal so far? Well, thank you for having me on your show and congratulations on your launch week. I wish you well with uh, this new programme and with the opportunity for issues like this to be broadcast and dealt with uh, at some length and hopefully with some sympathy. Um, look, I I'm a unionist and I think you've you put it very well in your mogalogue there uh, about um, how a citizen in the United Kingdom, whether they, whether they live in the most western part, the most northern part, southern part or eastern part, are entitled to equal citizenship. And I, just because I happen to live across a short stretch of water, I pay the same taxes, I obey the same laws, I'm subject to the same government, but suddenly the 2% of the country is treated completely differently. Let me give you a very, very specific example. I have a huge agri-food sector in my country. Of the 20,000 farmers in Northern Ireland, we feed about 15, 16 million people here in GB. So we make a food with a food basket for GB and we send that food across here. If, for example, one of my farmers wants to take his prize cattle to Ayrshire or to Yorkshire uh, to sell at one of the marts, he's able to do that. But if he doesn't get the right price, he can't just put them in his lorry and bring them back home. He has to quarantine them in Britain because he can't take them to this part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, and uh, for, for at least six months because the EU deems that Northern Ireland is not really part of the United Kingdom. It's part of their territory and cattle must be quarantined. That matter hasn't even been addressed in this withdrawal agreement. And yet farming is such an important point. I can give you numerous examples like this. There was a, you had a line there about um, medicines. And yes, that's wonderful for humans that we can now enjoy our rights to have the same medicines, the same cancer treatment medicines, and other important med medicines that other people in the United Kingdom can have. But I agree, food medicines are completely left off this. 
they've been given a one and a half year grace period. Um, and can that then be cancelled at the end of the one and a half years, or will the EU continue it? Do well, think? of course, the EU will then say, well, the grace period is now over. Uh, we want full implementation. And in other words, this affects probably about 50 or 60 per cent of every single medicine. Now, if you're making agri foods, and if you're uh, dealing with livestock, those medicines are crucial to the success of your industry. And suddenly, if your prices vary in that, and you're subject to seeking new, new drugs from inside the EU, and not the ones which we in the United Kingdom can use, that is a variable on our meat product. And that changes things. Now, is this an attempt to destroy our very successful agri-food sector? Well, the only country that has ever blockaded milk made in Northern Ireland, butter made in Northern Ireland, has been the Irish Republic. No other country has ever tried to blockade our good foods. And so this is potentially having a strong economic effect on your constituents because it's trying to upset the economic union. So it's not just the constitutional union you're concerned about, but the economic union as well. The economic union is where people feel it in their pocket. Uh, if, for example, 80% of all of our trade in Northern Ireland, this little part of the island here, 80% of everything we do is done with our mainland island. Only about 9% is done with the rest of the island. Um, it's that 80% that is most important to us. And we want to keep that internal UK market alive and fully functioning. And uh, protocol didn't do that for us. It put a barrier. Rishi Sunak's uh, uh, agreement uh, is a done deal as far as he is concerned. And he thinks that he's fixed everything. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Now, so we're examining the text this way. We're not rushing to judgment. We're not condemning this. I believe Russia is a, a genuine unionist. He's a Brexiteer like you and me. Um, but I do think that there are major issues here. And I, I like the way you started this piece tonight by quoting von der Leyen. The European textual documents on this are very different from the UK fluff that we have been handed over. We've got a lovely glossy statement. The UK textual documents do not sing this in the same, frame this in the same That's way. That's very important. Yeah. I think a careful construe of the two different um, papers may show that there are very different understandings. And the question is which one will be authoritative? If it's remaining under EU law, then of course the European Union one will be authoritative. And this uh, agreement struck will not be legislated on, I understand. So it's not law. It's a framework, it's a skeleton. And so what chance do you think there is of you going back into power sharing instalment? Well, that's a very significant question for the future of Northern Ireland. Um, my, my father sacrificed a great deal to get Stormont up and running. He is a passionate devolutionist and uh, we want the people of Northern Ireland to have a say in, in their future. So uh, whilst I'm caricatured in many ways by some media that uh, I'm hard line... Or not I'm, on GB I'm News. Up, definitely not on GB News, that I'm hard line or I'm anti the Assembly. I was a member of that Assembly for 13, 14 years. I served in it, I was a minister in it and I'm passionate about it. But, but we can't have unionist ministers in an assembly administering laws that are damaging the union and damaging Northern Ireland's place within the union. And it's really about this, not that you can't face being in power sharing with Sinn Féin having the Absolutely first not. minister role. <laughs> My father shared bar with Martin McGuinness. Yeah, but Martin McGuinness was number two to your father being yeah. number one. Yes, uh, I, I, I understand that. I will address that point. That is not an issue. That's a democratic will of the people. If the people want to change that arrangement, they can change that at the next election. So that, that will change, just as the personalities will change. Um, so that does not stop us. We're committed to devolution, but we can't administer a process that will not only undermine our standing in the union, but will affect for generations to come their future. You, you, you're a proud father. I'm a father and grandfather, although I look much younger. You look much younger than me. Yes, yeah, amazing. <laughs> and I want them to grow up with the same rights and entitlements that citizens here will grow up with. Final thought. I came to speak for you a few years ago, one of the yeah. biggest dinners I've ever addressed. It was an amazing atmosphere. And at the end, everyone stood up and sang unaccompanied the national anthem. Your constituents are the most patriotic people in the United Kingdom. What did you think about the audience granted by the King to Ursula von der Leyen yesterday? Well, uh, uh, I, I am a passionate uh, believer in the monarchy. It's so good for our nation. And uh, the foundation stones that have been laid by that, I, I hope, will reign for generations to come. Um, the sovereign obviously has to take advice from the government. And uh, I think at times the government gives dodgy advice. And the sovereign should never, ever be included or uh, engaged in something that looks like 
he's engaging in local party politics. This is a, a party dispute, a political dispute, and we've got to see it as that. He is well above that, but, uh, so I, I don't blame him in, in any way whatsoever. But I do think the government should be smarter about those things. Thank you, Ian. That was a brilliantly constitutional answer. The king can do no wrong, but that doesn't mean his ministers may not give him bad advice. Up next, is the government waging war on Britain's motorists? And should it reverse its controversial ban on the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars by 2030? Find out what you think, the people of Britain, and hear my thoughts in three. I'm not going anywhere, make sure you don't either. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm right. completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg and this is State of the Nation. Earlier today, when facing questions at a Coca-Cola factory, other fizzy drinks are available, in Belfast, the Prime Minister was asked a question about electric cars. He went on to explain. And because I think last year, God, one in five cars, I think, almost, electric. Right, I think that we're almost... So we're really on an upward trajectory here, so we've got to make sure that the infrastructure is there for us. Um, and That's a great claim. One in five cars. But let's just look at the detail. What the Prime Minister is referring to is the percentage of sales of new cars across the UK in 2022. This ignores all the second-hand sales, and perhaps more importantly, the fact that electric cars make up fewer than 3% of all cars in the United Kingdom. Furthermore, multiple car bosses, including those of Kia and Vauxhall, 
have warned that these beastly machines are simply too expensive for working people and the prospect of mass market options are unfeasible. The cheapest new electric car my team could find was for over £22,000 and it was a Fiat 500. I don't know about you, but I have a wife and six children. A car this small simply doesn't cut the mustard. Where would I put them? So, how does the government square these problems with the fact that all new sales of petrol and diesel cars are set to be banned from 2030? Well, this is the People's Channel. So for our nightly edition of Vox Populi Vox Day, we asked you, should the government reverse the ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars in 2030? And the people have spoken. Electric cars are rubbish. Yeah? They're rubbish. Yeah. The production of electric cars and make it more whole scale. Yeah. And if we can actually use it day to day, because right now the charging and stuff is a little bit difficult, yeah, sure, it's a good idea. But I don't think they should ban it per se. Like, if people want to drive cars, yeah. they can drive cars. I, think I just hope that the technology will catch up with that policy change. No, let's keep it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a mixed view of opinions there, but I'm joined um, by the environmental policy researcher, Laurie Laban along with my panel, political editor of The Sunday Mirror, Nigel Nelson, and journalist and author, uh, Joanne Nedler. Um, thank you very much for coming in. You're a great advocate of electric cars. What do you think, first of all, of the Vox Populi? And then do you think the ban is realistic? Well, let's just be very clear on what the ban is supposed to be doing. It's a policy that's part of a wider package that's going to hopefully drive down the price of electric vehicles. So this is not the case where come the time where we're not selling new petrol and diesel vehicles, they will still be at the same price. We will see a collapsing price. Um, the first mobile phone, which I think was released in 1983, cost $4,000, had 18 minute battery life and it weighed about a kilogram. And obviously we saw a reduction in cost and an improvement in technology. We'll see the same thing with electric vehicles as well. But why are you so confident of that? Because using batteries is not a new technology, mm -hmm. and they've been trying to miniaturise batteries now for a long time. They've had electric vehicles for a long time. I think the first electric taxis uh, came in at the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. They haven't managed to get the technology to advance so far. What, why do you think it will change now? It's improved hugely. Uh, the range on many electric cars now is in excess of 250 miles. Some new models coming out next year are pushing over 400, maybe towards 500. So the technology is improving all the time. And the reason why I feel so confident is because of things like competition and market forces, which will drive improvements in these technologies and already have. And the manufacturers of Kia and Vauxhall saying that it's not feasible? What do you so, say to them? Well, they, they, they do say it's feasible. So Stellantis, the, the owner of Vauxhall, has seen record profits partly driven by a 41% increase in EV sales. When they were talking the other day about the need for more money, it will help their bottom line if government puts subsidy in. So the world is heading towards electric vehicles. Those companies know that and they want more support. And they're from fishing government. for government subsidy. Joanne. Well, the government heavily subsidises electric cars already. I had to buy a new car last year, as indeed did my sister. I decided to buy a petrol car, slightly to make a statement. Um, and she bought an electric car, and she bought an electric car because she has a small business. And the tax uh, benefits of doing that were, uh, to all intents and purposes, paid for the car itself. Now, that is a huge uh, underwriting of the industry. Um, and uh, where I do agree with you to a certain extent, Laurie, is that, of course, that means that the prices are being kept, in a sense, artificially high, which would explain why, for so many people, and I don't think we know this statistic, but my hunch would be that if you look at that number, that 3% of, of cars that, uh, that you were saying, Jacob, are, are electric cars or were sold as electric cars last year, I would imagine that the vast proportion of them were sold as second cars. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what the environmental impact of that is, um, but it doesn't strike me as being a particularly sensible use of resources. Because keeping cars going to the end of their natural life is quite environmentally friendly rather than throwing them away and getting new ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the problem here really is there's so many obstacles put in the way of people who want to drive electric cars. Um, they're difficult to fill up. Uh, there aren't enough charging points around. So at the moment, the government have got a target to try and meet this 2030, get rid of petrol and diesel, got a target of 300,000 uh, 300, 
uh, charging points around the country. At the moment, they won't meet it. They need to actually up the the, num uh, the number that they're they're putting putting out there um, by three hundred percent a month at the moment. So it, it is those obstacles. Like Joanne, I was thinking of buying a new car um, last summer and looked at electric cars. Thought this was the right thing to go and do. That's and not like me. prices, <laughs> um, inconvenience. There was a whole host of reasons that ended up with a petrol car. And you must have read Giles Corrin on his electric car, which has been a complete disaster. Mm. To break down all the time and can never be charged Absolutely. fast enough. Yeah. Uh, and he's written very amusingly about it. Uh, and that must be off putting for people when not only may it break down, but when it breaks down, you can't tow it and charging takes a long time. But it's important we get them. Um, I and mean, I do believe that if, we, if we're going to reach the net zero target by 2050, there are so many things we've got to do. It's not that far away. So many things we've got to do to actually achieve that. And certainly electric cars are one way of doing it. So the important thing is that the industry, government, get their act into gear to make sure that we can actually start driving them around without too much hassle. And Laurie, you're confident that electric is the right technology uh, rather than thinking about hydrogen cars or other technologies that could be coming forward? I think the market's largely decided that electric is the bet to go for. We see that from where the car manufacturers are going, uh, the huge resources that they've pumped into electric designs, the fact that that's the dominant offer that they're making on the market at the moment, the fact that that will save people money. It's a misconception to think that even with higher electricity prices at the moment, it's still not cheaper to charge an EV at home, it still is, than using a petrol diesel car. And of course it sorts out other problems as well, not just the issue around carbon emissions, air pollution issues, noise pollution issues. So it's a, it, and that's another reason why car manufacturers are, are going for this. But um, Joanne, mm. isn't there an anti-car movement mm. in this country Huge, with yeah. um, restrictions on how people can drive, the 15 minute cities, Quite. the 20 mile an hour limits? And even if you're driving an environmentally friendly electric car, you can still only pootle along at 20 miles an hour and get overtaken by uh, yeah, fast so cyclists. One of the few advantages, it seems to me, of an electric car is that they do accelerate very quickly, and that can be quite an exciting experience for a driver. But obviously, there's pretty much nowhere where you can put that to the test. Uh, but uh, uh, Laurie's talking about a market, the market having decided. It's not a free market. I'm not quite sure what kind of market it is, but it, it, it's one that's largely been preordained by big manufacturers and big business and, and big government. Um, and it's not been exposed, really, to what, uh, to what ordinary people want and need. And to go to your point, Jacob, I mean, this is absolutely critical. Uh, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of mis-selling of the whole electric car issue on the basis that perhaps to those people who can afford them, they'll be able to use them to drive into towns. Whereas in actual fact, that, that, it, it, you know, the movement against cars also includes electric cars. So there are increasingly now areas uh, in London, I'm sorry to be metropolitan about this, uh, where you're in fact, you know, you're, you're heavily restricted in being able to drive, to park, uh, to use businesses, regardless of whether you've got an electric car or, of, or a petrol car. And, and Covid was essentially used to have a war on the motorist, wasn't it, with mad schemes like the one on Park Lane that was a great wide <sighs> road that people could use, um, now had an extra cycle lane put in, even though there's a cycle lane just a few yards away in the park. So there is an anti-motorist feel, particularly in London. Yeah, I think there, prob there probably is. Um, I mean, what I, what I think Sadiq Khan would like everyone to do in London is, uh, is cycle everywhere. Uh, and he's making it more and more difficult for motorists. The one thing I think that if you look towards the future and where we're actually going with, with uh, electric cars is a lot of that will disappear. If you've got an environmentally friendly vehicle which is not chucking out a load of emissions, it may well be some of these things can actually be relaxed. Um, and it does seem to me it is the only way forward. If we, are, if we believe in that target and actually reaching it, and not everyone does, if we believe in, in trying to uh, deal with climate change, it really becomes the only way forward we can actually go for. Well, you've created a great thought in my mind about the emissions from motor cars against the emissions from horses. I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> um, thank you, Laurie, and thank you to my panel. Still ahead, we'll be hearing more from my panel. Um, the off-gem energy price cap is coming down, but consumer prices are going up. How is this possible? It sounds like an umbrella that goes up and down. Find out why after the break. See you in three and don't touch the remote. You weren't thinking of it, were you?
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? No. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg and this is State of the Nation. We have a bit of a bizarre situation on our hands. Just yesterday, the energy regulator, Ofgem, announced that the price cap would be coming down in April. However, consumers are set to pay more. How does this work? Well, back in September, the government of which I was part, albeit briefly, announced that it would implement an energy price guarantee. And this was on a unit price that would mean that energy bills exceeding £2,500 for the average household would be kept down. The energy price guarantee is due to go up in April to £3,000, but that is lower than the new lowered rate of Ofgem's price cap, so the amount the public will pay will be on an average of £3,000 rather than £2,500 on current plans regardless of the announcement from Ofgem. I hope you're clear. If not, <laughs> mail Mog, you remember, and I'll explain it all over again, and we might get some slides to do it with two uh, and a presentation stick. But still with me, I'm glad to say, my distinguished panel, the political editor of The Sunday Mirror, uh, Nigel Nelson, and the journalist and author, Joanne Nadler. Um, so, Nigel, come on. What are you going to write for your readers to explain this conundrum, or do you think they'll understand it all straight away? <laughs> um, no, I think they'll be horrified. Um, I like the maths you've done. I think that, it, that uh, you seem to get that about right, and it, and it sounds completely mad. Um, and I'm sure you've got the ear of Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, who uh, can actually do something about this. So where we are at the moment is because the, the, the way that the government are reducing the energy support, although prices come down, 
down, that we're still at a point where um, they have to, that consumers must pay £500 more. The answer for Jeremy Hunt is he saved an awful lot of money because prices are coming down, about £9 billion. Uh, that's according to the, to the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He's got about £31 billion that, he, that um, he saved from borrowing. He's got a budget coming up, and the way that he could shoot Labour's fox is to keep prices at 2500 from April. Jan, do you agree with that, or do you think this I is think all perfectly be, that, sensible? That would be a sort of shrewd political move. But I mean, all of these manoeuvres, if I can put it that way, are rather short term, aren't they? Because they're really uh, a way of sidestepping the bigger issue of, of uh, creating uh, more diverse sources of energy, so that we're not so reliant on uh, imported energy and we're not so reliant on a uh, one specific source of energy. And uh, I think you know the government of which you describe yourself as having briefly been a part. You know, it was looking at some quite interesting ideas uh, around fracking. Um, and uh, and Boris Johnson, to give him credit, was also looking at expanding the the nuclear supply. And I think you know these are the sort of creative options that we need to be looking at medium and long term, not just whether or not we we um, fiddle about with the with the, the sort of price mechanism. But Nigel, you were talking about getting to net zero in the last section, mm -hmm. and gas is a transition fuel to net zero. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that as fracked gas emits less carbon than fracked gas imported from the United States, it was a very good idea to have fracking because it would actually reduce our carbon output, would help us get to net zero. But this wasn't particularly popular. What, again, do you think and what do you think your readers think about fracking? Um, I think that, that, that they're very suspicious about fracking. Um, I mean, there is the danger of, I mean, OK, not a major earthquake, but certainly um, damage to the environment, damage to, the, to their homes. I'm not sure I'd want a, a, I'd want someone fracking right outside my front door, for instance. Which See, I wouldn't be... mind, because... No, I mean, but, because the... Um, you, you're convinced it's, it's absolutely oh, uh, safe? Uh, absolutely. The, the okay. seismic effect is less than a fall of rock in a disused coal mine. And the problem is that earthquakes can be 0.1 on the Richter scale, mm. or they can be the sort of thing that's devastated Turkey and Syria recently. And because it's a logarithmic scale, I think lots of people don't actually pay attention to the difference. They think it's very similar. But 2.5 on the Richter scale is hardly noticeable. But what we could do is go to renewables. I mean, this is the whole thing. We, we, we then have the, the, the planning problem over things like wind farms. Um, so it, it seems to me that that would be um, a more user-friendly way of actually going forward if people were prepared to accept wind farms uh, in their site, not, not necessarily by their front doors, and go in that direction rather than fracking, which I think is so controversial, because we really don't know. But well, don't... I mean, the thing about the controversy over fracking, and I mean, I don't deny that there has been a controversy over it, but largely what seems to have happened is in areas that were uh, exploring the possibility of fracking, you, you've got activist groups essentially um, arrived and, and, uh, and created a huge amount of, of fuss and noise um, with uh, recourse to all sorts of ideological uh, concerns, uh, rather than looking at the actual facts on the ground. And that's well, happened and time and time again. the head of NATO suggested that they were funded by Russia because they wanted to maintain Russian supplies. I mean, I don't know that that's been proved, but certainly the head of NATO suggested that. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that particular complication, but uh, it, it, even if that were... Uh, it, even, even if that were... Uh, slightest possibility it just you know again underlines my point that i don't think we've actually had a genuinely open discussion about fracking in this country we've allowed activist groups to come in and, and essentially set the agenda and do you think that the push to net zero has put the cart before the horse it wants to get there but it's not focusing on cheap energy in between times and actually essential to the prosperity of this country both business and individuals is cheap energy and we should draw all the resources that we can to make sure that we're prospering for the next nearly 30 years. No, you're absolutely right. Cheap energy is the way forward um, and the question is obviously um, how you get there. Um, so when it comes to the Russians, I mean they didn't supply us with very much gas and mm. gas anyway but the, but the idea that you would then um, well take La Labour's plan, what they would have have is an energy UK, uh, it would be a nationalised industry, we'd start off with seed funding of about £8 billion, and the idea there is to create that, those kind of industries that would be both cheap and clean, and that seems to be the way forward. 
Cheap and clean sounds like a very good way forward. Let's hope that we can manage that. Um, we want to make sure what people aren't is cold and poor. So thank you to both of my excellent panellists. Coming up next, I'm talking to the brilliant former Conservative MP you all know and love, Anne Widdecombe, about some of her more controversial views, very few of them as controversial as mine, and how that affected her life in politics. We're back in three. Make sure you are too. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion, and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back to Save the Nation with me, Jacob Rees-Mogg. You've been getting in touch with your thoughts on male Mog. Selena has a brilliant point. She says, if three PMs have failed to achieve an agreement with the EU, what concessions has Mr Sunak made in other aspects outside of the agreement which made it invisible while all eyes are looking at the framework? I think she raises an important question, but Rosemary has the funniest. Um, line of tonight, I think. She says, never mind sausages or Coca-Cola. We are all in the Brown Windsor soup if the New Deal fails. I like the idea of Brown Windsor soup, which used to be very fashionable in the 19th century, but I'm not sure so much now. Uh, Curtis, very important, and I should have raised this, actually, because he says no one mentions how the batteries are made, the mining by young children in despicable conditions, the fact that the batteries cannot be recycled, the emissions used due to the weight of the car. But I think the key point is that about young children uh, and the mining for the uh, metals that are used in batteries. Um, and Colin on electric cars says, during the war, 
We had hydrogen power cars operating with internal combustion engines. We could achieve net zero with green hydrogen. I think this is really exciting, and um, uh, the, there are companies looking at this. The Bamfords are looking at this. Uh, we could achieve net zero with green hydrogen, and we could save money. Um, oh, and Thomas from SW1 says, can you have more time on the iPad? Well, I'd better attend to that as well, too. But moving back to business. Last week, SNP leadership contender Kate Forbes came under fire for her conservative stance on gay marriage. The member of the Free Church of Scotland said that she would have voted against equal marriage for people in same-gender relationships. This begs the question why a person who has conservative religious views is part of a lefty-leaning political party such as the SNP. But I have also come under modest uh, disagreement for my um, traditional religious views, orthodox religious views, and so has my next guest, Anne Whittacombe, former Conservative P, who now joins me all the way from Devon. Well, thank you, Anne. It's such a pleasure to, to see you, and I see you've got Hansard behind you, so you've been um, keeping abreast of parliamentary debates. But how did you find your religious views affected your political career? Uh... I don't think in those days it was quite such an issue. A lot of people held traditional religious views. If you remember, for example, when the vote on gay marriage went through the Commons, the majority of Conservative MPs actually voted against it. So it wasn't such a big issue then. It wasn't, for example, anything like as controversial as my stand on um, the war on drugs. Uh, so uh, in those days it was less controversial. But interestingly... When Hansard put together a, a commemorative volume for, for one of its anniversaries uh, and it asked uh, some MPs to choose speeches. Now, I chose one by Enoch Powell on the Embryology Bill for one simple reason. He actually mentioned God. Uh, and uh, you can't do that nowadays in the House of Commons. He did. I can't absolutely be certain that it was the last time anybody did, but it must have been pretty near. Yes, um, I, I have mentioned God actually occasionally in the House of Commons, but you're quite right. Um, the Almighty doesn't come on very regularly into political discussion. Uh, do you think William Hague is right when he said that nobody who now was not in favour of gay marriage could become a leader of the Conservative Party and therefore ruling out anyone who shares the orthodox teaching of the church we both belong to? Well, not only our church. I mean, that is the teaching of Islam as well. Um, you know that that is also in in its in its vague way still the teaching of the Church of England because you cannot have a priest performing uh, gay marriage in uh, Anglican churches. So it is very widely held uh, by different religions. But what really struck me was this: you know, Kate Forbes was challenged, and they said. Would she want to reverse the measure? You know, would she want to undermine it in any way? And she said no. But she answered straightforwardly when asked, had she been voting on it, which way would she have voted? Now, I wasn't in the House of Commons uh, when that bill went through. I would have voted against it. Now, I made that clear in speeches outside the House of Commons. Uh, so what the real intolerance is not Kate Forbes, because Kate Forbes is saying, I don't agree with this, but I do not seek to reverse it. But her critics are saying, you've no right to disagree with it in the first place. And if you do disagree with it, you can't hold high office. Now, I think William Haig uh, and the critics of, of uh, uh, Kate Forbes are wrong. True tolerance means saying, I don't agree with you, uh, but I respect your right to your opinion. Yes, and that must be the right way of putting it. But what's surprising about Lord Haig is that he um, is quite a tolerant figure in most areas. And I, I think you were um, his Shadow Home Secretary um, and worked very closely with him. Were you, were you surprised that somebody who you'd worked closely with came down with such an intolerant view of something that's been believed um, by people of many faiths for uh, generations? Well, I find it pretty ironic because, of course, it was under William Haig that the Conservative Party opposed Tony Blair uh, when he wanted to, and indeed did, abolish Section 28 of the Local Government Act. That was the one that forbade the promotion of homosexuality in schools. Uh, and William Haig, you know, led a party and decided that, that the policy would be that we were going to uh, oppose 
uh, the relaxation of that measure. So it's ironic now that William is saying that somebody looking back and saying that they would have voted in such and such a way uh, should disqualify them from high office. It, it, it's a nonsense. Yes, I was very disappointed when William yes. came up with that. Very disappointed indeed. Yes, no, I, I, I too was surprised. So I wonder if I can tempt you away from morality onto Europe, which is a subject that is always at the forefront of our minds. Have, have you had a chance to look at the uh, Windsor deal? Or the uh, brown Windsor soup, as one of my correspondents called it. Well, it is a pretty good not, soup. Not in detail. I haven't, well, what, what I'd like to say, um, I haven't looked at it in great detail, but, you know, there are obvious, there are obvious problems, even without taking a magnifying glass to it. One is, you know, the, the, the storm won't break. I mean, yesterday that was hailed as, as something tremendous and innovative and it was going to free Northern Ireland from EU rule. What a fuss. It says it can only be applied in exceptional circumstances. So that means the vast majority of EU law will have to be accepted. It's only in exceptional circumstances, and then they have to go through goodness knows how many hoops. So that was a nonsense. We were told yesterday we have control of our own VAT. No, we don't. We can't control the VAT uh, on, for example, alcohol sold in supermarkets, even if we can on alcohol sold in pubs. We haven't got back control of VAT. We were sold yesterday a packet of nonsense. And my only hope is that there are now going to be enough people looking at this, um, as the DUP particularly, that it will unravel over the next week as people realise it isn't uh, as it was presented. And the other thing which I haven't done, but which several uh, of my fellow Brexiteers have done, is to look at the EU texts. They're not saying this is some great new thing. They're saying they've made a few concessions around the edges. And that's what it comes down to. But basically, Jacob, I mean, ask yourself this. You know, we are the country who fought the Second World War, who stood up to dictators. And are we really now that same country, which is grateful for concessions from a foreign power passing law which binds us? Well, that's such a fundamentally good point. And it was really interesting that Ursula von der Leyen made clear that the European Court was going to continue interpreting European rules. I, I, I love the fact, Anne, that you say you haven't really looked at it in detail and you know more details about it than almost anybody else I've spoken to in the last 24 hours. I think that is your typical modesty and was one I of the reasons of your line, great uh, success as a... Line a line by line. But your point on the um, different texts from the EU and the UK yeah. government, I think, will be very telling. Um, you said you hadn't done that yourself, but people had been telling you about that. Uh, yes, um, there's uh, the uh, former um, Brexiteer MPs, uh, Brexit Party M MEPs, uh, still have a, a rather friendly group that exchanges information, and some of them uh, are laser sharp on this sort of stuff and will go right to the original texts. Well, of course, you were one of the most distinguished Brexit Party um, MEPs, along with my sister Annunziata, a fine and formidable wow. uh, combination. But th thank you, thank you, Anne. That's all from thank us. You. We'll be back tomorrow night from 8 p.m. Up next, it's Dawn Neeson in for Dan Wooten. Dawn, what have you got in store for us tonight? Good evening, gorgeous. I missed you this morning, like yesterday. Right, great show coming up. Yours was brilliant, but mine's going to be better. We have got the, the hideous uh, trans rapist up in Scotland. We have got kids in the school, Jacob, being taught there are 73 genders. I'm stuck on two. And finally, we have got Sadiq Khan talking vegetables. So it's all coming up. It's going to be a fun pack show and got some great guests lined up too. Well, that sounds extremely uh, exciting. Only 73 genders, some might say. You never know. Some people may come up uh, with more. There's that would be a fascinating conversation. And I hope there, um, Jacob. Come you on, have more harder. to say about uh, the mayor of um, London and his terrible ULEs as long as his, as well as his vegetables. But whether the weather <laughs> is fine or whether the weather is not, it's certain however the weather will weather, whether you like it or not. That's coming next, and then back tomorrow from eight.
Hi there, it's Aidan McGibbon here from the Met Office. Cloudy and showery weather will continue for many of us over the next 24 hours. Showers will ease later, leading to a touch of frost in some places. But for most, it stays cloudy because this area of high pressure, which is dominant across the UK at the moment, is continuing to bring a feed of cloud and some showers in from the North Sea. So the most frequent showers into the east and across central areas, but a few of them making their way into Wales and the southwest. However, the earlier showers and the longer spells of rain in Kent do tend to move away. Clearer skies moving in here overnight with a frost and Western Scotland, lengthy clear spells, so a frost here as well. But where we keep the cloud, three to five Celsius on the thermometer as we start off Wednesday. And we've still got further showers to come. They're going to continue to feed into northern and central England, southeast Scotland, parts of Wales, one or two into the southwest of England as well. But actually by the afternoon, many of these showers will ease. There'll be a better chance of some breaks in the cloud developing, some brighter spells, especially towards the south, the west, and more especially for western Scotland. 7 to 10 Celsius, not far from average for the time of year, but it'll feel more like 3 or 4 on that North Sea coast, given the breeze. That breeze will continue to bring some showers into the north and east of Scotland, northern and eastern England, one or two into Wales on Wednesday night. But actually, the best chance of clear spells is across southern counties of England, south Wales, northern and western Scotland. And it's here where we'll see a frost as we start off Thursday. Otherwise, 3 to 5 Celsius, a very similar picture compared with the last few days. A lot of cloud feeding in and a few showers. However, Thursday, I'm optimistic, does look like a brighter day for many, especially in the south and later on for Scotland as well. The cloud breaking up nicely. And by Friday, many places will be looking sunnier, although there'll still be areas of cloud floating about. Saturday, much colder weather sweeps into the far north. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the 